Okay, it's 12 noon and uh, we'll get started. Um, uh, my name is Jack Ringler and uh, I'm the medical director of the Sleep Disorder Center, the Berkshire Sleep Disorder Center at the Hillcrest campus of Berkshire Medical Center. I was just telling Dr. Letterer, I, I think we have the most beautiful sleep disorder center in the country, um, and hopefully one of the best as well. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to have worked for Berkshire Health Systems for 30 years, uh, most recently doing mostly sleep medicine. And so uh, it's an honor to be asked to join this terrific group of um, lectures and, and lecturers uh, to talk to you today about sleep and immunity uh, as part of the Build Your Armor series. So welcome and make yourself comfortable. They always say you're supposed to tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you said. So we're going to start with a segue um, uh, with regard to Emily Dickinson and something that, um, that Mark uh, referred to in her excellent lecture last week. I will present a case uh, to help us get on the way with um, this topic. We'll spend 12 minutes or so, good luck, uh, discussing clinical immunology, uh, concentrating on the current pandemic. Uh, we'll talk about the role of sleep and immunity and evolving science literally by the day, uh, along with the immunology of COVID. Um, these, these papers are coming out. A lot of the stuff I'm going to be referring to has been published in the last two weeks. So a quite remarkable uh, evolution happening. And then uh, we're going to coast a little bit after some heavy science uh, to talk about the real world problem as it regards sleep and immunity. That is that having somebody simply wave their finger at you and say, get more sleep, um, it isn't really a problem solver for most of us under this stressful set of conditions we find ourselves. And so we'll emphasize the fact that although a lot of what's written about sleep and sleep deprivation is quantitative, the fact that we don't know enough about the quality of sleep doesn't mean that it's not important. It's actually quite important and I would argue more important than the number of hours one sleeps. And finally, as we get deeper <laughs> up the river, if this was a uh, heart of darkness, uh, some very personal reflections uh, from the perspective of a now lengthy career in clinical sleep medicine about how one might uh, practically manage the issues uh, that are raised earlier in the lecture. And hopefully if I move fast enough, um, we'll have time for uh, uh, an active uh, question and answer session at the end. Okay, so you ready? Deep breath. Um, Marcy Simons uh, quoted a poem by Emily Dickinson called Hope is the Thing with Feathers. And as soon as she said it, I had this incredible um, visceral and emotional response because I know that poem. I don't know many, but I know that one. I know it because in 1976, as a college freshman, age 19, uh, I was facing a health crisis, um, and I was also a 19-year-old with hormonal and neurotic surges in all directions, and I fancied myself a musician before I decided to uh, go to medical school. The professors of music convinced me of that quite correctly. Um, but I wrote a, a, a song based on uh, Emily Dickinson's poem, and I dug it out, and it doesn't look so great after um, 40 years, but, but there it is. Hope is the thing with feathers. And we'll tease you by, um, if you can see my arrow, we'll figure out who Oscar is later in the, in the lecture. Stay with me. So objectives. I, I'm going to try to keep you awake for an hour. I'm going to try to promote wellness as part of the Build Your Armor series, uh, including not getting this virus um, through sleep cherishing practice. I'm going to foster an air of decatastrophization, which is my favorite medical word, um, and you'll understand it as we move along. I'll try to make you laugh a little bit, because that's good for your immune system too. Here's my disclosures. I have no conflicts of interest. I am turning into a cynical old geezer. I hope you're laughing. But I remain optimistic and hopeful 
at heart. So Dr. Letterer, you're the only guy I can see out there. So you're kind of the canary in the coal mine. If you're laughing, then I know the joke is effective. And if you fall asleep, I know I'm in trouble. So on we go. Here's the case. A 74 year old man presents with cough, fever and fatigue. He's an executive with a highly stressful position and he reports several nights of very little sleep in preparation for an important presentation at work. He admits to chronic sleep deprivation, but feels that sleep is, quote, a useless waste of time, end quote. His associates became concerned when he uncharacteristically slept on the flight back to his home in Washington, D.C. He describes a mild sore throat and nasal congestion preceding a non-productive cough, which began this morning. In the last few hours, he's become dyspneic, short of breath. He reports exposure to an associate who subsequently tested positive for COVID-19. His medical history is remarkable for metabolic syndrome, obesity, relative deconditioning, endorsing that he plays golf, but he uses a cart. His sleep hygiene has been neglected somewhat as he often engages in social media activity and television watching late into the night. On examination, he's fatigued appearing, he's in mild distress. Oral temperature 100.6, heart rate 112, which is fast, respiratory rate 24, which is quite fast, Blood pressure 160 over 95, mildly elevated. Saturation of oxygen at his finger is 90%, which is low, but not dangerously low on room air. On his chest exam through a stethoscope, he has crackles at the bases of his lungs. His electrocardiogram shows sinus tachycardia. That's a fast heart rate. And his initial chest x-ray shows diffuse subtle infiltrates at the bases of both lungs and at the center of his chest and his COVID-19 swab is positive. So this is a random case. Any uh, uh, identification is uh, coincidental. Here are the questions. Did chronic sleep deprivation predispose this patient to a COVID-19 infection? Second question. Did acute sleep debt impact the severity of his infection? And third, are fatigue and sleep adaptive uh, symptoms which may help his immune system fight the infection? And conversely, if he fails to answer the call to sleep and to rest, is he more likely to have a worse outcome? So we'll come back to this case later. Uh, it is char uh, it's typical, characteristic to quote a, 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 a classical uh, physician or philosopher and Mark Pettis quoted uh, Hippocrates about food and medicine. And so I'll quote Aristotle who recognized that when you eat, you tend to get tired and also recognized moreover, some kinds of illness have this same effect. Those arising from moist and hot secretions as happens with fever patients and in cases of lethargy. So the recognition that illness can make you sleepy goes back um, millennia. So the immune system is complicated uh, and an effort to try to explain it in 10 minutes is um, almost silly, but you know what? We're gonna take a shot at it. Um, so we start with this slide from Nebraska Medicine that quite nicely separates the immune system into three levels. The first is very important and not talked about a lot and that's barriers. That's your skin and mucosal surfaces in your body uh, that are the first line of defense against viruses and other pathogens. This is hand washing, masking, et cetera. Uh, the second level is called innate immunity. These are cells and chemicals that stop invaders from spreading. And finally, adaptive immunity, the third line of defense that ultimately knocks off the virus and other pathogens and also has a memory function that allows uh, uh, an organism to uh, uh, remember the pathogen so that the next time it encounters the pathogen, uh, it doesn't cause any trouble. If you want a lovely review of uh, immunology and COVID, uh, The Atlantic from August 5th, the author Ed Young 
but I want to reproduce this brief um, uh, story that he told at the beginning. He actually opens the article with this. An immunologist and a cardiologist are kidnapped. The kidnappers threaten to shoot one of them, but promise to spare whoever has made the greatest contribution to humanity. The cardiologist says, well, I've identified drugs that have saved the lives of millions of people. Impressed, the kidnappers turn to the immunologist who takes a deep breath and says, the thing is, the immune system is very complicated. And the cardiologist says, just shoot me now. So immunology is very hard to explain <coughs> briefly. Uh, here's another look at the difference between the innate system and the adaptive system, both of which are at play when we fight COVID. The innate system is fast and it's nonspecific. So it's out there as soon as your body knows that something is up. And it includes cells, uh, natural killer cells, dendritic cells, epithelial barriers. And it also includes proteins and other chemicals, cytokines. Uh, that cytokine means moving cells. So cytokines attract cells to the area of problem. So this is nonspecific and fast. The adaptive immune system is a series of lymphocytes and antibodies. The lymphocytes are T cells, which constitute helper T cells, the CD4 cells that uh, kind of coordinate the whole process, and cytotoxic T cells, CD8 cells that participate in the killing of the pathogen. But ultimately, the adaptive system leads to the production of B cells, which produce specific antibodies against the pathogen. That assists in knocking off the disease, but this is also the memory function of the immune system. So if I haven't put you to sleep yet, I'll, I'll show you my buddy Sleepy here, who's still awake, and we'll move on. The New York Times on October 5th, that's what, two days ago, published charting a COVID-19 immune response. And the diagrams in this article by Catherine Wu and Jonathan Corum uh, are the best I've seen as a simple explanation for what goes on. So I'm gonna have you bear with me for about four minutes. We're gonna walk through this article, which is in the Times from uh, Sunday. Um, and, and here we go. So to quash the virus, the immune system unleashes an arsenal of powerful weapons. Sometimes these turn inward and destroy healthy tissue. Combating this friendly fire has become as crucial a part of the COVID-19 treatment strategy as subduing the virus itself. So exposure to the virus, innate immune response, early nonspecific, viral load builds up in the bloodstream and in other parts of the body where damage is done, and then the adaptive immune response kicks in and the coordinated response reduces the viral load. So in mild cases, the immune system mounts the defense, launches a battalion of cells and chemicals against the invader. Most people who are infected with the coronavirus, as you know, recover, sometimes without even experiencing symptoms, and do not progress to severe COVID-19. In some cases, the virus may even be brought under control before it has a chance to become established in the body. But if the virus gains a foothold, it will swiftly infiltrate cells and repeatedly copy itself until levels of the virus or the viral load build up. Um, just for you, uh, Dr. Letterer, can you guys see my pointer uh, when I'm using it? I, I see your slide, but I don't see your pointer. Okay. So I just won't use the pointer and I'll, I'll point out what I'm talking about. So symptoms like fever, cough, congestion, and fatigue, like our patient, uh, signal that an immune response is underway in the body and may be driving the viral load down. Once the immune system has finished its job, symptoms may abate without medical intervention. But in severe cases, the clash between the virus and the immune system rages much longer other parts of the body, including those not directly affected by the virus, become collateral damage, prompting serious and potentially life-threatening symptoms. I'm sure you guys have all heard this over the weeks and months of the pandemic, 
but it bears repeating before we talk about the role that sleep plays. So stay with me another three minutes. A typical immune response launches its defense in two phases. First, a cadre of fast-acting fighters rushes to the site of the infection and attempts to corral the invader. This so-called innate response buys the rest of the immune system time to mount the second, more tailored attack called the adaptive response, which kicks in about a week later, around the time that the first wave begins to wane. In people with severe disease, however, the immune system appears to botch the timing. The first wave mobilizes too late and must play a frantic game of catch up that persists even after reinforcements arrive. Unhindered, levels of virus can rise dramatically and that in turn may push the immune system into prolonging the siege. So you'll see in this diagram, the adaptive and innate systems remain quite active in an effort to re reduce the viral load because the virus got ahead of the immune system. And as such, the symptoms persist. So this is a picture of the innate immune response in mild and severe cases. And here's the explanation. In response to the invading virus, the body rapidly deploys molecules called cytokines that act like microscopic alarms, mobilizing reinforcements from elsewhere in the body. Their arrival generates inflammation, tissues swell with blood and cells, the, the body and the tissues become warm, red, and sore. If the innate immune system makes early progress against the virus, the infection may be mild, but if the defenses flag, the coronavirus may continue replicating, ratcheting up the viral load. With a growing threat, the immune system continues to call for help, fueling a vicious cycle of recruitment and destruction prolonged excessive inflammation can cause life-threatening damage to other vital organs. And the heroic colleagues of mine in the ICU, Dr. Osman, Dr. Miranda, Dr. Callahan, Dr. Olberg, all the nurses, all the ancillary support in the ICU know exactly if any of them are out there, hello, we miss you and thank you for taking care of these guys, the severe cases. So in milder cases, the adaptive immune response is the second wave, which produces antibodies that flag the virus, destroy it or block it from forcing its way into cells, and also develops memory so that should this virus ever come back, that uh, patients will be immune to it. So very quickly about treatments. Uh, our, our patient, or you now have recognized that this is actually President Trump we're talking about. Uh, antiviral treatments include remdesivir, which is a direct antiviral agent intended to lower the viral load, and then the experimental antibody cocktail from the Regeneron company, which is intended to uh, 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 jump the gun on the adaptive system by providing uh, antibodies that lower the viral load. So that's the intent of early antiviral treatment, remdesivir and experimental antibody cocktails. Somewhat more controversially, the president received dexamethasone, which is a, a steroid, a potent steroid, that broadly blunts the immune system by curbing the activity of the cytokines. Clearly, dexamethasone has been shown to reduce death rates in hospitalized COVID-19 patients uh, who are very sick but we're not sure about whether it helps patients at earlier stages of the infection. And there's even a theoretical concern that suppression of the innate or the adaptive system could um, uh, blunt the immune response and also that the dexamethasone itself could have side effects. So that's a part of the care of our patient that is unknown and about which we're concerned. All right, I'm going to skip through this because it's the same stuff. I did want to uh, say that a wonderful article in Cell, the journal, uh, published on October 1st, uh, is worth reviewing um, because it describes the difference between severe cases and mild cases. And it suggests this, um, that if you're fighting a wildfire and you're prescribing a burn to try to control it, um, that occasionally the controlled burn gets out of control. 
And that's the paradigm for what may happen in an elderly patient whose uh, uh, T cells may not, there may not be enough of them or they may not be potent enough uh, it, it, to, to mount a, an adaptive re immune response that, that kills this disease, that kills this virus. The, 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 the thesis of this uh, article in Cell is that younger patients have a, a, a good, powerful, innate response with cytotoxic lymphocytes and helper cells working in cohort to produce antibodies and disease control. And that older patients and those with comorbidities may have components of those systems intact and working so that they're not purely, truly immune deficient in a, in a normal setting, but this particular virus, which either Dr. Letter or Dr. Pettis referred to as the perfect storm, um, will take an otherwise reasonably healthy older patient or one with metabolic syndrome and potentially kill them. So what's sleep got to do with it? So we're, we're, we're on schedule. Uh, Tina Turner, a great song from my residency, actually. There's a wonderful article published again quite recently, a year ago, by Dr. Besodovsky and Monica Hack, who's from um, Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, which makes the best effort I've seen to provide a comprehensive review of the crosstalk between sleep and immunity. Two really quite disparate physiologic functions, but they are related. So bear with me, the science part is almost over. This is a wonderful but somewhat complicated diagram, and I hope you can see it. It describes the relationship between the immune system and sleep on the left, that is how immunity impacts sleep, and on the right half, how sleep impacts the immune system. At the center of the diagram, you'll see a human with a brain that's sleeping, that's disease, and then you'll see bugs down on the left, and those <coughs> are pathogens, in normal life that elicit an immune response, inflammatory mo molecules, which Aristotle knew makes the patient sleepy, fall asleep on the plane on the way home from Minnesota. And the sleepiness and the sleep per se um, foster the immune response. So this is a virtuous cycle whereby you get, potentially get sick, you sleep it off, and the sleep itself aids your immune system. You with me? Is everybody getting that? Virtuous cycle. Outside that center is the bad stuff. So that on the left side, if your disease is too strong or the treatment of your disease is too strong and anybody who has taken steroids will know that it's very hard to sleep when you're on steroids. So disturbed sleep as a result of either a bad disease process or the treatment of the disease will impair sleep. And thus the virtuous cycle is replaced by a potentially vicious cycle because the disturbed sleep fosters the disease rather than the immune system because the inflammatory dysregulation associated with disturbed sleep will push COVID and other diseases along. So complicated slide but central to the thesis that immunity impacts sleep both favorably and potentially unfavorably, and that sleep impacts the immune system, again, both favorably when things are working well and unfavorably when uh, patients are very sick. So here's a little aside that we have time for. Sleep and immunity both involve memory. This is fascinating that both sleep and immunity involve encoding, so right now you're listening to me and some of what I'm saying is getting in. And similarly, antigens are taken up by immune cells in the adaptive, I'm sorry, the innate immune response and then presented to the other cells, the T cells in the immune system. This tends to happen more efficiently in slow wave sleep. That is non-REM, deep, restful sleep, the sleep that makes you feel great the next day. Common misconception, REM is not deep sleep. REM is very strange, dreaming, paralyzed, active brain sleep. It, REM is important, but REM isn't what makes you feel great the next day. Slow wave, stage three, non-REM sleep 
is what you need to feel great the next day. It's also what you need to facilitate the antigenic transfer of information to T cells, the consolidation of immune memory. It's also what you need to pass the exam you're going to get on my talk. No, no exam, just kidding. But if you're studying, uh, anybody who's ever studied knows that a good night's sleep before the exam is better than cramming up until the moment that you take the exam, and, and that's been demonstrated. And then finally, recall. So sleep aids in long-term memory, and it also aids in long-term immune memory. Just fascinating that there are these analogies. And there are also shared uh, neurotransmitters, hormonal connections uh, that connect these two systems. Beyond that, hard to get in an hour but a couple of really intriguing anecdotal uh, studies that are worth mentioning. So there are studies in vaccination for influenza, two forms of hepatitis, A and B, herpes zoster, which is shingles, and maybe COVID, we this is all speculative, but there are, there are vaccination studies that demonstrate that sleep deprived subjects mount a less potent antibody response to vaccine. And in the setting of the hepatitis A study, that was clinically significant. That is the amount of antibody that was generated after vaccine in a sleep deprived subject was insufficient to protect against the disease. Small study requires more work, but the notion that if you're sleep deprived when you get a vaccine or in the days after the vaccine, that your immune system is not as effectively responding to that vaccination is fascinating to me. Equally fascinating is this somewhat unethical study from 2015. I chaired the ethics committee for about 10 years. I'm not sure if, if I was part of the uh, committee to, to, to pass studies that, that this one would have gotten by, but it's a great, fascinating study. So they took 200 or so healthy volunteers and these people agreed to have rhinovirus dripped into their nose, common cold virus, okay? And they wore actographs on their wrist to detect semi-objectively how much they were sleeping uh, in the days um, uh, after they were exposed, I'm sorry, prior to exposure to the virus. So in, I think it was four or five days prior to the virus. So look at this graph. If you slept less than five hours, your chances of catching an, an objective cold, and they actually measured nasal output, fever, and other um, cytokines in your system, 45%. If you slept more than seven hours, it was down to 20%. So a prospective study um, in, in subjects in which sleep was measured semi-objectively, and clearly there was a dose response relative to the amount of sleep you got after exposure. Interestingly, the viral load was similar in all of the groups. So they all got the virus, but only those who were sleep deprived got sick. Fascinating, right? So sleep and immunity clearly related. And um, animals who are deprived of sleep will die. Uh, REM deprived animals will become hyperthermic. These have never obviously been done in humans, but humans with chronically diminished sleep are more likely to be diabetic, obese, have cardiovascular disease, dementia, and depression. Of course, that's an association. It's not a cause and effect relationship necessarily, but these things clump together. And here's a very important point that I didn't know where else to put in the talk. If you ask about in the COVID pandemic, the most important point about getting sleep, I think this is the one. If you're sleep deprived, you get kind of executive function diminishes. You, you don't make great decisions and judgments. So things like wearing a mask and washing your hands um, uh, are less likely to occur if you're sleepy and frankly, if you're intoxicated. I have noted, although I don't know of any data about this, that a lot of the super spreader events seem to be centered around taverns and restaurants and bars. And I wonder if part of the problem is that sleep deprived or intoxicated people are making bad decisions. So I just wanted to mention that. And let's make it clear that we, we don't want to say simply that if you don't sleep, you're going to get sick. 
Um, because, and also that if you don't sleep, you're going to get dementia, heart disease, etc. That connection has never been demonstrated prospectively. The association is clear, but the alarmism surrounding how much sleep one is, quote, supposed to get is going to constitute the second half of this talk. And um, I think I'm going to skip that one slide here. Is the lack of sleep, is it the lack of sleep or the stuff that's causing the lack of sleep causing the increased uh, infection risk, right? So if you have insomnia, that might be because um, you're using cocaine or because you're taking Adderall or because your life is so phenomenally stressful that the stress in and of itself is causing an immune dysfunction. And the other lectures, uh, Beth P. and Tony about not enough exercise and Marcy Simons about um, uh, 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 the lack of spiritual and social connection and Mark Pettis as always uh, talking so uh, wonderfully about nutrition. Um, th those stressors may be part of the deal, if not the big part of the deal, we don't know. But we know something, and this is the last science in the hour, I promise. Pathogens are recognized by the immune system. That's what this, these stars are, right? So the recognition uh, leads to production of regulatory substances which modulate the immune system, we know that, but they also modulate sleep. A number of studies now have demonstrated that the same chemicals that are working through the innate and adaptive immune system are also modulating non-REM sleep. We've already talked about that, but now we have chemical proof of it moving forward. If you get sick and the load of pathogen is higher, then not only does your non-REM sleep increase, but your REM sleep seems to decrease. We don't know whether that's an adaptive response or a maladaptive response, but we've recognized that sleep is impacted by the immune response by the same chemicals that are moving the immune response forward, okay? And then finally, when the attack is overwhelming and the cytokines are flying, then sleep itself suffers. So patients, as I said earlier, who can't sleep because they're so sick may be in bigger trouble, not just because they are so sick, but because they can't help themselves by sleeping. Or to summarize, finally, after a half hour, a well-rested patient is more likely to get a mild disease, which in turn will potentiate sleep, and which in turn, in turn, supports the immune response. So I put Z's at the bottom of this diagram from the New York Times for mild cases, meaning that you get exposed, innate response kicks in, viral load is mitigated and tempered, adaptive response occurs about the time when you develop symptoms, you sleep it off, and the system works to correct uh, homeostatically, uh, the organism's health. Virtuous cycle. Vicious cycle. A sleep deficient patient is more likely to get severe disease, and that in turn disrupts sleep, which in turn hinders the immune response. Got it? Right? Okay. So that's the science. Now, clinical implications. This is from Dr. Bedazovsky's paper and I'm gonna go through them quickly and then give you my personal view. Sleep is a biological need like hunger and thirst. So adequate duration and quality of sleep help maintain immune health. Patients should be educated to attain sufficient sleep after receiving a vaccination to strengthen the vaccine response. That is new and worth um, both studying more, but also since no harm can come of it, when you get your flu shot, get some sleep the night before and sleep well the few days after, and the same when, God willing, the COVID-19 vaccine comes to us. Adequate sleep duration can improve infection outcomes and is associated with reduced infectious disease risk. Chronic sleep deficiency disturbs immune homeostasis, thereby presumably increasing the risk for development and amplification of several diseases in which immune dysregulation is common. So there's a growing sense, and Mark Pettis talked about this to some extent, 
that immune dysregulation causes a low-grade inflammatory response, which we don't need and which contributes to the pathophysiology of heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, autoimmune disease, and neurodegenerative diseases. So, so clinicians should be aware that there are many diseases comorbid with sleep dis disturbance, and here, here it is. Encourage patients to improve their sleep behavior and educate them about sleep hygiene, good sleep habits. This may have a beneficial effect on severity and progression of disease. I agree. And various medications can disturb sleep. Um, and look what's prominent in this list, corticosteroids, disturb sleep, and they need to be considered in, in treatment decisions. But, and now here's where the, you'll forgive me, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm allowed to give some opinion, but it is my opinion and my view of, of sleep medicine practice. So take it as one person, not as science everything before this was science. Simply saying you better sleep more or else is not helpful. In this stressful setting, people need help with this. And um, I'm telling my patients, trying to get a smile out of them, that if you're sleeping normally now, there's something wrong with you. This is a crazy time. And I've never had trouble sleeping um, and I'm having trouble sleeping. So I'm resonating and empathizing with my patients better than I have earlier in my career because this is the age of insomnia. Why do I call this the scariest book I ever read? Do you guys know this book? Um, Matthew Walker was at Harvard, uh, here it is, a Harvard PhD who is now at Berkeley, I think. And it's a terrific book and I shouldn't insult it. It's a wonderful summary of the science of sleep and some clinical sleep medicine but it's alarming. It, the whole thesis is, you know, if you don't sleep, uh, horrible things are gonna happen to you. You're gonna have a car accident, you're gonna have cancer, you're gonna have COVID-19, although he didn't have COVID-19. Um, so the, the alarmist um, uh, lay press media, even medical view of sleep deprivation needs to be tempered. Why? Uh, because if you're going to treat insomnia, the first thing you have to do is decatastrophize it. That was me after the debate. So most of us sleep okay most of the time. As I said, if you're sleeping normal now, there's something wrong with you. The tenets of sleep hygiene, things about temperature and exercise and eating and caffeine and smoking um, and meditating and relaxing, uh, the, they're very helpful for most people most of the time. And you'll find a list of them in the introduction to this lecture series, and I commend it to you. But those rules can break down the same way the immune system can break down. And that's where sleep medicine comes in. Patients will come to me waving the sleep hygiene measures and saying, I did all the sleep hygiene stuff and I still can't sleep. And unlike food and exercise and spirit, simply endeavoring to sleep better may not work. And the point I wanna make here strongly is that that effort may actually join the other team. So the harder one tries to sleep, the worse it may get. So here is Dr. Ringler's coming to terms, a practical, personal, real world approach. It may be a little too personal, but bear with me. The world is changing at an explosively rapid pace Many changes have occurred since 1976 when I thought I might be a musician. Since 1979, more than 40% of the polar ice cap has melted away. And it's worth remembering that this is not the first pandemic that Mark Pettis or Jim Letterer or Jack Ringler have dealt with. Um, 1983, a patient came into the ER at Dr. Hack's hospital he had a rash on his back, he had cryptosporidium in his stool, and he died a week later of uh, AIDS. And there have been 36 million deaths from AIDS since uh, 2000, I'm sorry, as of 2012. But hope is the thing with feathers. When I attended the New England Journal's 200th anniversary, presentations at that medical symposium indicated that if you were an, an American HIV positive with access to health care, your life expectancy is two years shorter than the average American life expectancy. 
1983, HIV was a death sentence. And now HIV is a chronic disease. So we'll get COVID. It's not the same dynamic as HIV, but um, it, it, it's the second major pandemic of our, of our careers. Um, I'll do this very quickly. The other change is obviously screens. Uh, this red line is the uh, hours per day looking at a screen. You're participating in that now. The average American is spending eight to nine hours a day looking at screens. And that's a sea change relative to a generation or two generations ago. This is TV watching when the blue and red is the exponential rise of screen watching. So I worry we're spending so much time on Facebook that we're losing our ability to connect with people on Twitter. This is the quote, Erwin Shaw, sleep is the first great natural resource to be exhausted. In this 24 seven world, it's easy to understand that our lives are different. They're busier, they're uh, fuller, in some ways, they're quite a bit healthier. Uh, in some ways, they're not, as Mark said in his talk. Um, but one thing that's definitely changed is that we're 24-7, 365, and our agrarian great-grandparents were not. So sleep is an innocent bystander of that change. The chart on the left, I hate, and I've already explained why. The notion that you must sleep 8 to 10 hours a night or seven to nine hours a night, or 14 to 17 hours a night, depending on your age, belies a lack of recognition that quality is as important as quantity. If Mark Pettis came out and said, you must eat 1,875 calories of food a day, but it's okay if it's all Wonder Bread, that would be all quantity, no quality. And that's how I view the, the chart on the left. We're naive if we think that the number of hours that we sleep is the total answer to sleep. It certainly has something to do with it, but on the right is a subjective sense of Americans. And basically a third of us uh, think we're sleeping well, qualitatively. A third of us think we're sleeping okay. And a third of us think we're sleeping pretty badly, qualitatively outside of how much we're sleeping. So that's principle number one. And principle number two is what I usually talk about for an hour, which is obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, a disease that's more common than asthma that affects somewhere between four and 10% of the population that's associated with another pandemic called the obesity pandemic that's affected us for the last 30 or 40 years. Mark says 70% of us are overweight and 40 to 50% of us are obese. So this disease has become a, a, a remarkably morbid, common, and treatable cause of quality sleep problems or prototypical qualitative sleep disorder. Very quickly, two minutes, what happens? Five minutes of sleep recorded in our sleep lab in a 300 pound truck driver who was uh, not admitting that he was having trouble driving. This is his brainwave pattern at the top. The top eight rows are the sleep itself, stuff pasted to his head. And even somebody who's never seen a sleep study before will notice that there are five brief interruptions of sleep in that pattern. You see the ink splashing there? Okay, so below is the breathing pattern. And to summarize very briefly, this patient cannot breathe and sleep at the same time. When he's sleeping, his upper airway is collapsed like a paper straw in a milkshake. And when his brain gets wind of that, it interrupts the sleep and pulls the airway open with a loud snort. And then five breaths later, when the oxygen level has been restored, the brain returns to sleep, never knowing that it's been awake. And the patient does not die in his sleep from this, but he awakens in the morning with a quote that I never forgot. He said, Doc, if I, was gonna, if I knew I was gonna wake up with a hangover every morning, at least I could have gotten drunk last night. He was a recovering alcoholic. And that's what it feels like to wake up from this kind of sleep apnea. So we put CPAP on him. This is CPAP, it's not big, it's not nasty, it's easy. Air gets pumped in through your nose, it opens your throat. And this patient said, I'm wide awake for the first time in 10 years it's a miracle that I didn't kill anybody on the road. 
my headache is gone, my snoring is gone, I don't get up to pee anymore, I'm down to one beer per night, I've changed what I smoke because I live in Massachusetts, I've joined a gym, and Mark probably wouldn't advocate for the Atkins diet, but he was on it, and he's probably less likely to get COVID-19. So that's what diagnosis and treatment of sleep apnea can do. And I strongly recommend that that simple adage, sleepy snorers should be studied, four S's, I couldn't make them Z's. Sim sleepy snorers should be studied. That's a 70% risk of sleep apnea. So we need to see those patients. Insomnia is more complicated. And with 15 minutes left, I'm gonna give you my personal view of insomnia, which is not occasional trouble sleeping, it's a lot of trouble sleeping. And then we'll finish. Sleep is very important, but it doesn't like to be scrutinized. And so insomnia is a vigilopathy. It's heightened vigilance with potential to disrupt, disrupt normal function. It, vigilance, which may be a blessing right now in order to stay awake through my talk, may be a curse at two o'clock in the morning. Clinical insomnia is most commonly a dysregulation of vigilance so that the normal hormonal and neuronal mechanisms that serve to heighten your alertness so you don't get robbed and so you're aware of your surroundings and so you're good at your job and good at parenting will bite you because chronically conditioned behavioral patterns perpetuate the acute response unnecessarily. And so like chronic pain and low grade inflammation, they're unnecessary and they mess you up. So here's conditioned insomnia quickly. Pavlov's dogs. You, he drools when he sees the food. He doesn't drool when you ring the bell. If you present the bell and the food at the same time uh, and then get rid of the food, he drools when you ring the bell. Conditioned behavior. Using your intellect to try to sleep on command at two o'clock in the morning is like asking the dog in the purple circle not to drool when the bell rings, conditioned insomnia. I'm gonna to have to skip Dr. Weinberg, I hate to, but if I have time, I'll come back to him. Cherish your sleep, acknowledge and embrace its importance. How could sleep not be important? Why would we become unconscious and stop eating and stop moving and defending ourselves if it were not crucial to the survival of the species? Activity and rest cycles, sleep and wake cycles, serve immunity, metabolism, cardiopulmonary and nervous system function because we evolved on a rhythmic planet. And how organisms relate to the, uh, the, the astrophysics surrounding how life evolved on our planet is the subject of wonderful and ongoing research. Cherish your sleep, but don't lose sleep over it. I know that's silly, but it's true. Recognizing that dogma and intellect in an aimed at trying to sleep better often makes sleep worse. And understand that as a bodily requirement, unless the machinery is terribly broken, most of us maintain the ability to sleep when we need it, sometimes when we don't need it. If you're on the mass pike between exit two and three and you're sleep deprived enough, you may drive off the road. That's sleep that you need, capital N, right? But there's a difference between that sleep and the sleep you need, small n. You do need that small n sleep, but you shouldn't conflate it with the other. And that's where the problem starts. Decatastrophizing insomnia doesn't mean blowing it off. It means not giving the symptom a life of its own. So I can't go through a lecture without quoting my dad, who died about seven years ago at 91. He said, as a confirmed insomniac over years, at 2 a.m., if I'm awake, I solve some of the world's problems. He never let it bother him. And that's why probably he made it to 91. And then finally, as a critical care doc, I witnessed many more deaths than I would have wanted to. Uh, but the only deaths I ever witnessed that were related to insomnia resulted from the overtreatment of insomnia. And Michael Jackson is an example of a person who died because he thought the insomnia was killing him, and instead the treatment for the insomnia killed him. So sleep restriction. When I asked a psychologist what you do about it, he said, well, you can train the dog not to drool when the bell rings, but it's really hard, and it is really hard. 
You have to recruit organic sleepiness so that you retrain the signals for sleep. You understand what it feels like to be uncontrollably sleepy. And that's a very effective treatment, but it's a very difficult treatment, but it's risk-free. And it doesn't cause you to fall on your way to the bathroom after you've taken a sleeping pill when you're 79 years old and osteoporotic. So it's a treatment that's underutilized, um, and not terribly cost uh, um, uh, intensive, quite cost effective actually. And along with the treatment of sleep apnea, cognitive behavioral therapy of insomnia is something everybody should know about. And it is even available as an app validated from the VA in North Carolina, where a lot of this work was done, um, as CBTI coach. I personally, uh, when I'm training, would prefer to have a personal trainer. And if I needed cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, I would probably want a human coach. And we have a human coach here, John Harrington, um, among others uh, who can do this therapy. So sleep restriction is about learning the difference between the sleep you capital N need and small N need and teaching your brain to respond to the capital N and not to join the other team by sweating the small N, what, what might be somewhat euphemistically and a little bit irreverently called the sleep damn it syndrome. Clutching the sheets, everybody in the world is asleep, why can't I sleep? Got it? Okay, hope is the thing with feathers. Who's Oscar? Well, it was dedicated to Oscar um, because I, I want to raise this as, as, as sleep being analogous to a relationship with a cherished person. Oscar was not a person. Oscar was a thing with feathers. Oscar was a parakeet. So he was the parakeet of a young woman who the 19-year-old version of me was smitten by. Um, and I was pathetic, as only a 19-year-old young man can be, uh, and strained terribly her kind ability to even try to remain friends with me. And finally, I learned two things about relationships that I think are appropriate for you and your relationship with your sleep. This is the personal part. Trying harder can make it worse. True of relationships with people, true of sleep. And the relationships work better when you find the right plane on which to have it. And clearly, uh, this relationship wasn't intended to be a lifelong uh, mating. It was intended to be a lifelong friendship. So cherish your sleep, but don't suffocate it. In a world where we're conditioned to accept the ethos that if we work hard enough and try hard enough that we can get anything we desire, sleep and love are the two things which may not respond very well to that ethos. So cherish sleep as if it were your first love, understanding the naturalness of a relationship, what it should be or could be, is the key to finding the way forward. This can be painful, and I sense in patients to whom I recommend reconciliation with the fact that they'll likely never be ideal sleepers. The same disappointment I felt when I finally realized that Oscar's owner was not going to spend her life with me. And of course, it was the correct path. Uh, it turns out she and I remain friends. Uh, she's been married for 36 years to a lovely guy, and I've been married to my dear heroic wife for 34 years. So you can become a better sleeper too with some of that same reconciliation. And here's what it requires. You have to consider reinventing your relationship with your sleep. You have to forgive it. You have to make peace with it. And then you have to make friends with it. So like immunity, the balance between embracing the innateness of sleep and the adaptivity with which we must apply to live in the real world is in my judgment, the way to sleep better. See what I did there? Just, he's not laughing. He's not sleeping either though. Okay, when I, when I first got here, patient said, after being treated for insomnia, I thought my sleep had betrayed me now I realize that I had betrayed my sleep. A nice, lovely, thoughtful patient who was being grateful. So let's review quickly and then there'll be time for questions. Homeostasis is a series of virtuous cycles. If you're gonna be well, there are gonna be stresses that will challenge that wellness. The yellow lightning bolts are the stresses. And the blue arrows pointing inward are the homeostatic mechanisms that are intended to restore wellness. 
and virtuous homeostatic cycles include these lectures, better nutrition, better spirit, better fitness, social, social uh, um, uh, uh, engagement, and reconditioning generally. And sleep and immunity falls into that. That's a virtuous cycle that I described previously that will allow you to get sick, sleep more, get a better immune response, and then get, get well. Virtuous cycles. Homeostasis overwhelmed is a series of vicious cycles. Those are people with conditioned insomnia who are trying so hard to sleep that they're sleeping less well, not more well. A cytokine storm is an immune system that was intended to stop the wildfire and has become the wildfire. That's a vicious cycle. And maladaptive stress responses are what I've come to call breaking person syndrome, disorders of pain processing, fibromyalgia, and others. Disorders of eating, stress eating, and others. Deconditioning, disorders of mood. Um, these are vicious cycles because if you don't exercise, you get more deconditioned. And when you try to exercise, you hurt your knee, and then you get more deconditioned, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where the sleep immunity thing fits in to the larger thesis of the lecture series. So finally, four minutes, what am I doing? Well, I'm wearing a mask, not now, but here. I'm distancing. Um, hand hygiene, and I don't think anybody can avoid touching their face. I'm sorry. If there's data to the contrary, Dr. Letter, tell me, but I, I, I haven't seen it. Um, less obvious. So exercising, that's, uh, I'm doing my um, what, bird dogs. Um, music, art, sports, family, built a fire pit with my own two hands. Now my back hurts. Um, snuggling with my dog, fighting the urge to eat tater tots. Mark, just don't watch this. Cover your eyes. Um, not so obvious. Making more time for sleep. I am making more time for sleep, and you should too. Making more time for rest. If you can't sleep, at least rest. Your body likes to rest. And one of the things you can do in the middle of the night, you know, they say get out of bed and do something else, like my dad. But it's also okay to just lie there and listen to music and relax. It's not so terrible, even though it's against one of the tenets of sleep hygiene. <laughs> Listerine, I found this article about oral rinses targeting the viral lipid envelope in COVID. There's no uh, prospective data about this and nobody's saying you should drink bleach, okay? But Listerine is harmless. Listerine actually faced a, um, a class action suit in 1976 and the Federal Trade Commission said they couldn't advertise as, present, as preventing the common cold. But COVID-19 is not the common cold and it's not influenza and so why not? Your teeth might be happy and your breath might be happy. And make sure that I'm very well rested when I get my COVID vaccine and get my influenza vaccine. And try to imagine looking back on this time. This is a crazy time. This is Lucy and Ethel in the chocolate factory. Remember, the thing's going fast. They're shoving the chocolates in their hats and elsewhere. And then when they finally keep up with it, the forewoman comes out and says, speed her up. So every good deed is, is punished by more, 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 more. So build your armor. Slow her down. Let her go. Be grateful. Forgive. Laugh. Hope. Cherish. Don't break. Affirm your capacity to recondition your mind and your body and make a good faith effort to sleep. Three of my favorite songs, quickly. Uh, this is from uh, Leonard Bernstein's Candide. You've been a fool and so have I. We're neither pure nor wise nor good. We'll do the best we know. We'll build our house and chop our wood and make our garden grow or we'll build our fire pit. Uh, from Stephen Sondheim, no one is alone. People make mistakes. Mothers, fathers, people make mistakes, holding to their own, thinking they're alone. Honor their mistakes. Everybody makes one another's terrible mistakes. What a remarkable sentiment that is. And then finally, you all know this one, the secret of life is enjoying the passage of time. Try not to try too hard. It's just a lovely ride. That's James Taylor, 1977. So. We wish the patient a full recovery. Did chronic sleep deprivation predispose them to COVID-19 infection? Yes. Did acute sleep depth impact the severity of infection? 
very likely. Are fatigue and sleep adaptive symptoms which may help his immune system fight the infection? Yes, but will dexamethasone get in the way of that? And do we have to always weigh risks and benefits of any treatment? Absolutely. So we did a segue, a case presentation, a discussion of immunology, a discussion of sleep, a discussion of real world issues, and a little bit too personal stuff about my love life. And now questions. And one last thing. Maintaining a sense of humor into old age. George Burns gave a press conference at his 90th birthday. And the first question was, Mr. Burns, what does your doctor say about that cigar you're smoking all the time? Answer, my doctor's dead. <laughs> he's, he's laughing. This is the <laughs> Emily Dickinson poem in full. So second, I won't read it. We have time for questions. This is our team. Um, and our team uh, does a wonderful job caring for patients with sleep disorders. Uh, we're open for business, both clinically and the laboratory. Um, talk to us if the things that you're trying aren't working. And uh, thank you so much for having me. I hope the hour was um, informative and maybe brought a smile to your face. Um, Sam tells me that if I hover over Q&A um, that I can uh, take questions. I don't. Yeah, Dr. Ringer, Ringer, yeah. I have a question for you, just sure. to start. You, you made a very strong case for sleep, um, certainly from the COVID perspective and the immune response. Uh, the question I have, and, and let's totally um, separate it from treatment of insomnia, but if you had an acute illness where your sleep was disrupted and it's an infectious illness where you're hoping to you know, have some positive outcome seven, 10 days down the road, are there any studies that show a benefit to a non-addictive sleep aid? I'm not aware of any. Um, there are studies of um, uh, uh, subjective uh, sleep amounts having better outcomes, uh, but I'm not aware, it's an excellent question, um, of studies of uh, sleeping pills per se um, uh, uh, changing outcomes. In fact, I'm not aware of studies of sleeping pills changing outcomes for any prospective goal. You, you probably know that if you look at all sleeping pills, um, that the average improvement in number of minutes of sleep over the night is somewhere between 12 and 15. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's a fascinating question as to whether instead of dexamethasone, our patient had gotten Ambien um, or both, um, but I, I'm not aware of any data. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I don't see any open questions. I hope if they're there and um, I'm not missing them, but it just means that I answered everything. Uh, thank you so much for having me and uh, pleasant dreams. Thank you, Dr. Wrangler. Yep. Oh, hold on. There's a question. Yep, we do have one. Okay, well, I'm happy to take it. 67-year-old male, good health, overweight by 20, wake up nightly at 2 to 3 a.m. to take a bio break. So is the question, is that okay? And the answer is, that's okay. Um, there is actually some archaeological data that suggests that our pre-industrial forebearers had two sleeps, one between about 10 or 11 and one and two in the morning and then they stoked the fire and probably checked the moat to make sure they weren't being invaded, and then they went back to sleep. So there's actually some evidence that awakening in the middle of the night once is uh, biologically appropriate, um, but uh, it depends. If you get back to bed and you can't fall back to sleep, that could be a problem. Um, what's the easiest way to get back to sleep? That's my answer. Uh, Sit tight and just let it let it roll over you. Don't think too much about it. What is the process to reevaluate the need for CPAP and adjust the pressure? So it's a complicated question, but a very good one. Um, the machine itself spits out some data that can help us with that question. But if it doesn't, then a, a trip back to the sleep lab, or at least a trip for a consultation, um, is appropriate. What else? Nobody wants to uh, challenge my singing. 
<laughs> okay. Well, I think we're over time, so get back to work, but um, sleep a little more. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Engler.